In the early days of the Altair, MSI, and similar computers, mass storage consisted of paper tape or cassette. Of course, this was, this was miserably slow and not that reliable, and if you were trying to do any sort of serious software development, especially assembly language, then this was just an absolutely crippling environment to try to work under. Uh, floppy drives, of course, would help this, but none of these manufacturers would come out with floppy drives for these systems for about another year after the period I'm talking about here. And even then, those floppy systems were geared mainly towards users of BASIC. A good assembly language development system with floppy disk was yet another year or more after that. So if you were looking for an off-the-shelf solution, you had a good long wait ahead of you. The only other option? Do it yourself. And that's exactly what we're going to look at in this video. We're going to look at the hardware effort to connect a disk drive to our early Altair, and then the software effort to integrate that drive with, for example, the, an early assembly language development environment that expects a cassette, hook in the floppy disk instead so that it's much faster, more reliable, and makes this whole effort worthwhile. Now, just the fact that this is even feasible, uh, a possible option at all, is to me what makes this period in computer history the most exciting of all. You could have an individual like you or me could fully grasp the hardware and software in one of these computers and in our home or garage modify the hardware at its lowest level or modify software at its lowest level to make the machine do exactly what you wanted. And in fact, sometimes, like we're seeing here, it's the only way to make it do exactly what you wanted. So I feel very lucky to be a part of this time in computer history. It was a lot of fun. You learn a lot. It's very rewarding. All right, so of course floppy disks did exist before the Altair was shipping. For example, we're going to look at a drive made by ICOM called the FD360. It was shipping in early 75 before the Altair was really shipping. And that was a dual drive cabinet that made it very easy to add IBM compatible 8-inch drives to almost any computer system. They achieved this by putting the complex controller in the drive cabinet itself and only requiring a very simple generic parallel interface in the computer. Probably a card that already existed for that matter. So this ICOM FD360 found its way into many computers like Data General and DEX PDPs and others. And it was also actually hooked into people running uh, Motorola 6800 development system and Intel's 8080 development system. In all these cases, the ICOM drive was a less expensive solution than buying the disk drive subsystem from the manufacturer of the computer. All right, so the drive we're going to integrate is actually the one you see here. It's an FD3712, but this is actually just an FD360 repackaged with the drives to be side by side like you see here. So technically this could go into a 19 inch rack. It uses the same controller boards on the inside. There's two of them, exact same interface over to the computer. Uh, it's still uses 8-inch drives from Pertec. It's just a repackaging of the FD360. In the computer, um, if you were doing software development back at this time, you were running MITS Programming System 2. Uh, it was uh, designed to let you do software development in a cassette environment. And yeah, I said it's crippling, but the fact that you could do it within the constraints of these early systems, it's actually a pretty amazing piece of software. It is an editor, assembler, debugger, and then a monitor that lets you run all those things and run the programs that you write. And it'll work in a computer with 12K of RAM and a cassette for mass storage. Again, hard to do, but the fact that it could do all that in that environment, it's, it's a pretty impressive little piece of software. So if we can integrate into that and speed up the mass storage step to use a disk drive, with its much, much quicker transfer and seek, and then of course, uh, more reliability, I think it will dramatically improve uh, the usefulness of that assembly language development environment. That's what we're gonna wanna try and see if we can do. Otherwise, it won't be worth all this time and money. But in the end, trust me, it, it's worth it. It's quite an impressive uh, improvement. Now, before we go on with this, I would recommend that you watch or rewatch some of my um, older videos where I cover some of these things already. For example, there's a video on the FD3712 cabinet you're looking at, and there's also a three-part series on using the MITS programming system too that would be worth scanning through just to get familiar with uh, that piece of software. After you've looked at those, then come back and finish watching this video and uh, we'll dig into it and get right into the meat of it. As we've mentioned, we're gonna have to find a parallel interface board in order to connect this computer to the disk drive. So I started digging through my old stash of boards to find a 
parallel interface board that would have been available back in the early days of the Altair. And the board I found is this blue board you see right here. This is made by a company called Solid State Music, which was known for their blue boards. This is a um, IO4 board. Over on the right, it has support for two bi-directional parallel ports, two in, two out. That will take care of the requirements we need to hook to the disc controller. And then also over there on the left, it's got room for two serial ports. And if you take a look at this header right here, this allows us to strap this board to look like other serial boards. For example, we can make it look like Altair's 2SIO. That way we can use this board as the console for the Altair software we have. That's the programming uh, system too. That is our assembly language development system and for basic for that matter. So this will save a slot in the board, which will, you'll see in just a minute is important. And it also saves power, of course, in the um, computer, a slot in the computer, not a slot in the board. All right, connections to this board are through these um, 14 pin dip sockets you see up here. You can connect to these with a header that you, uh, you run wires to, or you can connect to them using uh, ribbon cable. There's connectors that will press onto ribbon cables and fit into 14 pin sockets. And that will allow us to easily hook to this board. Now, before I show this board all hooked up to the drive, Let's take a look inside this computer. This is an early Altair that we're going to be using. If we take a look inside, we can see it still has the original power supply. It has just two of the floor slot motherboards. You can see them down there. So over here on the end, I've got the Altair's 88 PMC board. This is a 2K EEPROM board. It uses the 1702 EEPROMs. These were the first commercially available EEPROMs, just 256 bytes each. What I have in there right now is Altair's MBL Prom. That's the multi-boot loader. That allows you to load basic and other programs, anything on paper tape and cassette from Altair, without having to toggle in a bootstrap loader on the front port. This saved a few steps. And we can also use it to load the programming system we've been um, talking about integrating the disk drive with. Okay, right behind that is one of Altair's 16K static RAM boards. At this point in history, that board would have been brand new, just out. Um, but it would have made all the difference in the world for making a project like this happen. To do any sort of effective development, you're going to have to have at least 16K of RAM. Um, and you'll see here there's really not room for four 4K boards or power for it. Plus, the 4K boards from Altair were awfully unreliable. The 16K static RAM ended up being pretty reliable for them. Um, and I have room here, I can put another one in. 32K will make a, an even better development environment. Once I can afford it, let's say. All right, right behind that is the uh, standard Altair 8080 CPU board. Right behind that, I've got a uh, cassette interface board. Now, as you can tell, this is not the original cassette interface board. This is a newer board called the UIO. It was made towards the end of the MITS era. It combined a serial port and the cassette interface on one board. Uh, now, unfortunately, I sold my original uh, Altair cassette board about a year ago on eBay. So uh, I'll have to use this board, but I have the serial port disabled because um, we're going to be using the one on the IO, or the IO4 board, the blue board. And then um, we will just use the cassette interface part, which is identical to the original, both hardware and software interfaces. Even this cable is the same cable that runs to the back and gives you your audio connections for cassette. And then here in the end, we will put our interface board over to the uh, disk drive. All right, so let me go ahead and put that in and we'll finish looking at how that IO4 board connects to the disk drive. All right, I have the IO4 parallel interface board installed so we can take a look at how all this goes together now. Here on the end, I've got the IO4 board. I used a header and discrete wires to do the three wire interface for our console port. And then I used ribbon cables for the, the two data out ports and the one data in port. So these two on the left, these are uh, command out and data out. These ribbon cables go over to the disk controller and they come in right here on this top port on the top board. On the bottom board is another connector. This is the status and data out. That comes over to our interface board and comes in this last port, which is an input. And at that point, I'm completely hooked up. Now, like me, you might be surprised to see perfectly clean cables just running between these two drives without any sort of board in the middle to swap all the wires around. What are the odds that all these have the exact same pinouts between the two boards? 
Well, the odds are basically zero. However, well, almost zero, nothing's impossible, right? However, they did both line up the bytes of the port um, such that the eight bits occurred across eight consecutive conductors uh, in the ribbon cable. So I can position these on eight bit boundaries. So you can see this is eight bits, this is the command out, and I've got it positioned to catch the eight bits that are on this port. And when I bring that in over here, I've also got it positioned to catch the eight bits of a port. Now within that port, the bits are not in the same order. So I will have to do some swapping around, but the byte itself is aligned. So here's another eight bits plus two ground bits. That comes over to here. You can see here we had the two on the right that are open and here those two are filled. Those are two ground positions that happen to be ground on that uh, 14 pin connector as well. All right, and then here on the data coming in, you can see that I've got the eight data bits in the same position and on the two ground bits on the far right, I actually skipped one wire. So that was really the only special wiring I had to do. And other than that, I have this very nice clean interface between the two. I was really surprised, it worked out nicely. So now the question is what kind of performance penalty might I hit having to swap the bits within the byte around? Well, that ends up being less of an issue than I originally expected because I got to thinking, when you write a byte to the disk, it'll end up getting scrambled onto the disk. However, when you read it back, it'll get unscrambled and you'll have your original data back. So for the data loop where I'm having to read and write things quickly, I don't have to do anything at all. For the um, commands that you write to the controller and the status bits you get back, uh, those will clearly have to be translated. However, those are just static equates in your source file and there's just a few of them. So those you can convert ahead of time to what they should be. So that won't have any performance penalty whatsoever either. So finally, that just leaves two pieces of information that are gonna have to be translated on the fly. And that is the track number and the sector number. So um, those I'll have to go through the conversion, but it's really not that um, time consuming a conversion. It probably takes 10 microseconds or so. There's a, a couple of shifts, a couple of ands and an or. To, uh, to flop the bits around as needed. And when you seek a track, that doesn't occur very often. And when you specify a sector, that doesn't occur that often. That's all in the you know, tens of millisecond range for a operation that's only gonna take you 10 or 15 microseconds. So that translation won't be any big deal at all. So this ends up making a very nice clean setup in the end. And I'll show you that translation when we get up to writing the software. So at this point, we've got our hardware all configured and we've got the two hooked up to each other. The next step would be um, to write some software routines to see if I can seek a track and read and write a sector. So that's what we're gonna do in the next video. We'll wrap this one up here with the um, culmination of the hardware um, of this project. And next, like I said, to the next video, we'll go ahead and start working on the software to actually integrate this drive.